Chapter 9 A ringing came from his pocket. Gabe slipped out his cell phone, noting the realtor was calling. The house. Gabe groaned. He had forgotten all about the house and the crazy offer he had insisted the realtor make just yesterday. He had been so busy catching up on work when Candy had called him. He had thought it would be a nice surprise for Brittany if they had the house ready for when they came back from the honeymoon. Gabe quickly accepted the call. Candy, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you sooner. You got the house, squealed Candy. It's so exciting. The owners were so pleased by the offer you made, they decided the inconvenience of immediately moving out was well worth it. They are going to live it up at a hotel until they find their new home. I have got the keys and the paperwork. All you need to do is the final payment and the house is yours. Brittany is going to be so happy. I'm so happy for both of you. Gabe closed his eyes in pain over the realtor's misplaced enthusiasm. He tried to say something, but couldn't think of what to do. Did he tell her Brittany had left him? Gabe, inquired Candy, are you still there? Yeah, he managed, just a little overwhelmed. I know exactly how you feel, enthused Candy. Your first home with the soon-to-be missus. Did I tell you I have also sold Brittany's condo? This is a whole new start to your life. Would you like to meet me at the house? You can have the keys tonight if it's convenient to you. Suddenly, a thought came to him. Brittany loved this house. No matter what she chose to do with her life, she would always love the house. She had sold her condo and didn't have a place to stay. Gabe could give her the house. It was a chance to make her happy. He was going to do everything he could to make her happy. Gabe would show Brittany how much she truly meant to him. Candy, you have connections in the construction and landscaping industries, right? Gabe asked, excitement churning within him. He had a game plan to try to win Brittany back. I know some reliable contractors who will be able to help, Candy promised. Anyone who can be at the house by tonight? questioned Gabe. I have some work which needs to be done immediately. I want this house perfect before the wedding. I'll need a decorator, too. Someone who can get things done quickly. I already know what Brittany wants. I might be able to make that happen, said Candy thoughtfully. A rush job will likely cost more, but I'll call around to see who's available. Perfect, replied Gabe. He hung up with the promise to meet her and the contractor at the house. Grabbing a sheet of paper and a pen, Gabe set to making a list of all the things Brittany had mentioned during their tour. If he put a few extra items on the list he knew she would enjoy, then it was all to her benefit. Short hours later, Gabe had two sets of keys in his hand, the signed paperwork, and a contract with a contractor. The designer Candy had managed to scrounge up had been great. She came with all sorts of magazines, and right away Gabe and Candy had managed to tell her the vision that Brittany had for the house. Everything was coming together. Tuesday, four days until the wedding. Gabe knocked on his father's door. While the doorman had let Gabe into the heritage building, and the maid had let Gabe into the large condo where his parents lived, Gabe still maintained the habit enforced by his father to knock on the closed study door. The four-bedroom condo was a rare find in the city, with the old-world charm architecture and large windows. As kids, Gabe had hardly paid attention to the scarred wooden floors or the impressive moldings. It had simply been home. Now, Gabe supposed it would pass on to Parker at some point. Come in, came James' raspy reply. Gabe opened the door to find his father sitting behind the large wooden desk. The antique was from a captain's quarters of an old ship which had ferried over the original Ramsley family, however many generations back. Gabe hadn't paid much attention to the details of the stories his father had told about the family. Perhaps he should have. Soon, James wouldn't be there any more to ask. Even now, he had a nasal tube for oxygen seated below his nose and looped over his ears. His color was a dull gray. "'Are you going to keep staring at the oxygen line or have a seat?' challenged the old man as he sorted through papers on his desk. "'I was staring at the mess on your desk,' lied Gabe as he sat in one of the two leather chairs across from his father. "'What's all this?' 
James batted Gabe's hand away from the sheaf of papers strewn about. Don't you worry about it. I'm just organizing a few things to make it easier for Dottie to find. While I'm at it, I'm doing a little purging. If you need any help, I have a little time on my hands, offered Gabe. Why would you have time on your hands? grunted James. Don't you have some hospitals to run? Not really. Gabe cleared his throat. I resigned to the board today. James stared at his oldest son before exploding. Now why would you go and do a fool thing like that? I didn't meet the expectations of your ultimatum, Gabe quietly informed him. Brittany and I are not getting married before your deadline. I felt it would be better press for the company and family to simply say I resigned rather than have to explain to the board and the public the real reasons. The wedding isn't until Saturday, huffed James. Find someone else. No. Gabe was firm. There's no one else I'm willing to marry. Why not? demanded James. You're going to give up your legacy for some girl who doesn't even want you? Gabe refused to be drawn into an argument. What's done is done, Dad. I have resigned. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. Disappointed? sputtered James, his face turning red. Are you going to leave the business to Parker? He doesn't know how to lead a company like Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation. He is a surfing bum. Is he who you want to take your place? He'll bankrupt the business. Gabe narrowed his eyes. He didn't appreciate his father's lack of confidence in Parker. Right now, the company has a complex issue, which could involve a very negative impact on this family and the security of Ramsley HMC if anyone were to find out. Do you know who has been handling the issue? Parker. He discovered the problem, has developed a solid strategy to get the company through the problem, and is implementing it. I would say I'm more than comfortable leaving Parker in charge. He has proved himself to me many times. Since you've retired, I've been giving Parker more and more responsibilities, and he has excelled. The only person I would be just as comfortable giving the company to is Marshall. And we both know Marshall would have difficulty not bankrupting the chain of hospitals. He has such a big heart and wants to save everyone. Neither of them are ready for being the head of the company, growled James. You are the firstborn. I groomed you for this. Your ultimatum had unintended side effects, Gabe pointed out. James shook his head in disappointment. You are such a wimp. You are a Ramsley. You could have anyone. I want to be certain when I die this company that I built from its inception is safe and has a future. I don't want anyone. I want Brit. Gabe could feel his temper rising. He leaned forward in his chair. Why is it this company is more important than your son's happiness? Parker is more than capable of running the company. In fact, he'll be better at it than I am because it's his passion. He loves it as much as you do. Why can't you see that? Why can't you have some faith in him? You're always putting Parker down, always tearing into him. Why? Gabe waited with bated breath. Maybe, finally, his father would just admit the truth. James turned an alarming shade of puce before letting out an aggravated breath. Because I can't forgive him. Finally, murmured Gabe. Finally, the secret is out. James lowered his brows, frowning at Gabe. What are you talking about? You knew? Parker isn't your son? Gabe leaned back, folding his arms. I've known it for years. You cheated on Mom with your secretary, and Mom cheated on you with Uncle Oscar. It was a party. They both had too much to drink, muttered James, his color abating back to the dull gray. I was away, and your Aunt Mary, well, let's just say she's not the easiest person to live with. It happened one time. I forgave Dottie the moment she confessed the whole episode to me. As for my affair, it was a mistake. Your mother forgave me. You forgave Mom, but you can't forgive Parker. What choice did he have? It wasn't his fault his father isn't you, challenged Gabe in disgust. Every time I look at him, I see Oscar, grimaced James. I had to be harder on him. Otherwise, he might turn out to be like your worthless, lazy uncle. Oscar always needed constant babysitting. He wasn't a businessman. If he had his way, he would be at a continual party on some beach. We practically ran his business for him. 
I had to make sure Parker didn't take after Oscar. That's why you hate the surfing so much, realized Gabe. Surfing is a bum sport, groused James. Ramsley's play golf, a true gentleman's game. Gabe shook his head in disbelief. You need to forgive and make peace with Parker. He is the one who's going to be leading the company into the future. Not only that, but he's been raised to be your son. You owe him forgiveness and acceptance, or you owe him the truth. A silence stretched out between them as James thought it over. You're certain you're not going to resume your position? When I resigned, it felt right, admitted Gabe. I've never thought of doing anything other than leading Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation, but leaving my position to Parker was the right thing to do. I believe in him. You think he'll do a good job? A hopeful James asked reluctantly. I know he will, affirmed Gabe. He slowly put a hand out to his father. Thank you for teaching me and trusting me to take your place when you step down. I learned a lot. First time you've ever said it grumbled a pleased James as he shook his son's hand. Gabe stood up, looking down on his father who was becoming more and more frail. It was about time I did say something. Past time, really. You can visit, you know, a gruff James announced. The prison I'm going to will allow visitors. They have these things called day passes. When are you scheduled to go? A somber Gabe questioned. January 7th, answered James. I'll spend one last set of holidays here. They're being very lenient, remarked Gabe. That's part of the deal we brokered with the FBI. James coughed. He waited until he could breathe again properly. I expect Parker and Marshall will be on honeymoon for the holidays. I will be here, promised Gabe. James nodded. That's good. Gabe sighed. I should go talk to Mom now and... Let her know I won't be getting married this weekend. She'll be disappointed, mentioned James softly. She's not the only one who is disappointed, Gabe said softly. I have a plan to win Britt back, but I'm not sure she'll agree to have me. Gabe saw what might have been sympathy in James's face before giving him a nod of respect and exiting the office. Knowing his mother enjoyed spending time on the balcony with the greenhouse for flowers, Gabe headed there first since it was usually where she could be found unless she was at one of her weekly charity meetings. Stepping past the large potted plants into the small glass greenhouse, he saw Dottie puttering away as she watered her plants, softly humming. Mom, do you have a moment? I have something I want to talk to you about. Smiling, Dottie put her watering can down on an old table. I always have time for my boys. What is it, Gabe? You look a little sad. I have a bit of bad news, Gabe informed her. Brittany and I might not be getting married. Dottie looked down at her gardening gloves. Slowly, she peeled them off and stiffened her back. Are you sure you can't get her to change her mind? Buy her some flowers and apologize for whatever happened. When you're in a relationship, you learn to forgive each other. Otherwise, the problems just sour the marriage. I have been hurting Britt for a long time now, Gabe replied. Flowers aren't going to fix this. I have a plan in mind, but I'm not certain it will work. If it doesn't, I might just have to give her some space before trying again. Space is the last thing a girl needs, murmured Dottie. Space is where separations, breakups, and divorces happen. You need to go talk to Brittany. I promise I will talk to her, vowed Gabe. All he had to do was find her. When he had called Naomi today, she said she hadn't seen Brittany. Not trusting Brittany's mother, he had gotten verification from the housekeeper. Dottie sniffed and wiped away a tear. I'm sorry. For all her quirks, I really do like Brittany. I know you liked her as well. Somehow, the word like just didn't fit, Gabe thought. He more than liked Brittany. He was going to miss her, all her clutter and chatter, if he didn't figure out a way to fix this. I was thinking maybe we could offer my spot to Jake if things don't work out between Britt and I. He and Sterling have wanted to get married for a while now. All our family would be there, and hopefully it's enough time for her family to come. That would be nice, nodded Dottie. However, don't give up hope just yet. I don't plan on it. Gabe gave her a kiss on the cheek. It was time to do the next part of his plan. 
A short drive later, and he was outside of Tara and Rex Hudson's family home. She had to be there. Gabe laid on the doorbell. There weren't any cars in the driveway, which suited him fine. Tara was still at work, and it looked like Rex had gone as well. Gabe didn't think Brittany had gotten her car from the dealer yet. She had been torn between a minivan or an SUV, and Gabe had been no help with making the decision. As far as he was concerned, she was driving it, and it should be her choice. They had only been planning on having one kid, so what did it matter how many seats were in the vehicle? Brittany had blathered on about playdates and school friends. At that point, Gabe had tuned her out. Now he felt a little guilty over the whole matter. Maybe he should have listened to her a little better. Realizing that no one was coming to answer the door, Gabe peeled his finger off the doorbell button. He tried the knob, but it was locked. Didn't they have a housekeeper to let him in? Scowling, Gabe circled the house, trying various doors and windows to see if they were locked. He hoped the security system wouldn't go off, as trying to explain what he was doing was the last thing he wanted to do. What was he doing? Gabe wondered as he wandered into the backyard. It had been three days since he had last seen Brittany, one day since the fateful conversation with Tara. Part of him thought she was right. He would probably do Brittany more harm than good by being in her life. Gabe had been examining what others had been telling him and found that their concerns had merit. He was a selfish guy. Yet he couldn't leave this alone. He couldn't leave Brittany alone. Max was right. He probably was the most terrible guy in the world, but Gabe did have feelings for Brittany. He could finally admit maybe he did feel possessive of her. He didn't like the idea of her finding happiness without him, and maybe he was more than willing to try to put Brittany first for a change. Finding the back patio open, Gabe tentatively entered the house. He carefully sidestepped around a large pile of boxes, following the sound of crinkling bubble wrap into the living room. Gabe looked around in amazement at the number of boxes, full and empty boxes, which surrounded Brittany as she sat on the floor amidst bubble wrap and packing tape. I'm sorry. Brittany wiped away a tear, heedless of who she was talking to as she hugged a large stuffed teddy. I know I promised to get all this packed up and labeled to return to the FedEx guy. I just got a little distracted by the flower ring hair pieces for the flower girls were going to wear. I don't think I should return them. I'll let the girls keep them. They'll have such fun playing dress-up with them. Then I saw the bear, and I just needed a moment. It's the first toy I bought for the baby, and I'm having a hard time giving him back. The thought of putting him in a box and sending him away is like admitting it's all over. Don't worry, I'll get the living room cleaned up. I promised I would get a dent in it by tonight, and I will. Brittany's voice trailed off in surprise as she looked up to see Gabe. She blinked at him. I thought you were Rex. I'm not Rex. Gabe carefully came forward, conscious of the overcrowded living room full of boxes and wedding items Brittany seemed intent on returning. Leaning down, he cleared a spot so he could sit down and join her. "'Why are you here?' whispered Brittany as he sat beside her. Avoiding the pain in her eyes, Gabe looked at the bear she was clutching. "'You bought the bear for our baby?' Brittany nodded. "'There isn't going to be a baby. I should probably return him so some other lucky boy can have him.' "'I think you should keep him.' Gabe reached out to touch the ear of the bear. He'll just remind me of what I can't have. She shook her head, holding the stuffed animal a little tighter. You should go. I'm not going anywhere, he quietly told her. Brittany digested his words. Then you can help clean up all this mess. I need it boxed and labeled so the FedEx guy can pick it up tomorrow and all of it can go back. What if it doesn't have to go back? Gabe looked at the mass of items and wondered where it had all come from. It has to go back. Brittany wiped away a tear angrily and drew in a shuddering breath. We are not getting married. We are not having a baby. There's no point in keeping any of it. Uncertain of what to say, Gabe reached out to take Brittany's hand, but she moved it away from him. He could feel the chasm between them deepening and wasn't sure what to do to fix it. Before, Brittany had always been the one to try to bridge any gap. 
Gabe cleared his throat. Do you remember when we were kids and our teachers used to make us play what if to teach us critical thinking skills? I don't want to play what if, said an exhausted Brittany. What if I want to return the shares you gave me? Gabe absently picked up some bubble wrap, fiddling with it. What if I've seen my lawyer and I have already given them back to you? Brittany looked at him solemnly. It's your inheritance. What if I bought the house? The one with the ugly yellow nursery within walking distance of the park that you like so much. Gabe popped a plastic bubble. The one you wanted to make into our home. You didn't. Brittany held the bear a little tighter. You didn't buy the house. You are not giving me back the shares. Stop playing what if. I don't want to hear it any more. I did. Gabe dropped the bubble wrap and pulled the paperwork out of his jacket, holding it out to her. Your name is on the deed. When did you buy it? She made no move to take the proffered papers. A couple of days ago, Gabe informed her. I put the shares back in your name this morning. Why? Why would you do it? Brittany's voice broke. You have everything you want. You've got your inheritance, you've got to keep your job, and you don't have to marry anyone. You got exactly what you wanted, so why would you do it? Because I realized there was something I wanted more, he admitted. Someone I wanted more. I want you, Britt. No. Brittany closed her eyes. You don't. You never have, and I have finally accepted it. I was a jerk, okay? A huge, colossal, monumental jerk. Gabe reached out to cup her face in his hands. I don't deserve you. I'm the one who was an idiot all these years, trying to deny what I felt for you. To deny us. I'm sorry. I want to start putting you first, to put us first. I want to be all in on this relationship. Stop. Brittany sobbed in earnest, pushing his hands away. I can't do this. Please just stop. We can get married whenever you want, wherever you want, he rashly promised. We can have a baby. I'll be with you every step of the way. No matter how freaked out I get, I'll stay with you in the delivery room. I'll be there when you have the operation to remove the cancer. We can adopt more kids if that's what you want. No divorces, no prenups, no deadlines. We'll do whatever you want. I want you to love me, she whispered. Can you do that? Brit. Gabe reached out to her, but she moved away. He swallowed hard over his discomfort. What did he know about love? Was it this need that he had to keep Brit in his life? Was it this panic in his chest over the thought that he was permanently losing her? Was it all the gooey things Max said it was, which Gabe didn't seem to feel? What really was love? Gabe honestly didn't know. I want to love you. You want to love me, she echoed slowly. Yes, Gabe affirmed quickly. Please, give me another chance. I gave you so many chances, Gabe, sighed Brittany. We aren't good for each other. All we do is hurt one another with our ideas of what the other person should be. We just mess it up. I know, I messed it up. But I won't mess up this time, vowed Gabe. I don't want to lose you. You never had me, Brittany said dully. I never had you. Brit. Please try one more time, he asked desperately. I'll be right there trying with you. Please leave me alone, she pressed her face against the plush bear. Just go away. Brit, pleaded Gabe, just one more time. It's too hard, Brittany told him exhaustedly. I'm broken and tired. If I try one more time and it doesn't work out, I won't be able to pick myself back up again. I will pick you up if it comes to that, but I don't see it happening. With both of us working together, we can make this relationship solid. Gabe's voice trailed off as Tara came into the kitchen, staring at him in shock. What are you doing here? I thought I told you to leave her alone. Tara came forward, crouching beside Britt and enveloping her in a hug. Tara? Gabe ran a hand through his hair. All I want, all you want is to make her unhappy again. Tara glared at him. You are toxic, Gabe. A monumental pile of trash. If you don't leave, I'm going to call the police and file charges for trespassing, harassment, and whatever else the lawyers can think of. 
Tara, please. He sighed, tired and aggravated. Britt and I need to talk. What you need to do is get out of my house, she stubbornly insisted as she pulled out her cell phone, fingers hovering over a call button. Get out now. This isn't over, Gabe vowed quietly. As he took a last look at a crying Brittany, he rose to his feet. Tara tilted her head back to look up at him. If you have any feelings for her at all, it will be over. You will leave her in peace so she can figure out how to live her life without you in it. You need to stop destroying her. I want to try again, Gabe tried to convince her. I want to try to be the person Brit needs. You will never be that person, Gabe. Tara rubbed Brittany's back. You don't know how. You don't know how to love someone other than yourself. That's not necessarily true. Gabe defended himself. At least he hoped it wasn't true. There was a lump in his throat preventing him from speaking. He wasn't going to lie and say he loved Brit. It was the ultimate question every woman wanted answered, and he couldn't answer it. He had no experience with love. He knew all about duty, pride, loyalty, and family obligations, not about love. It didn't matter. He had no answer, and Tara knew she had won the argument. Gabe had lost and had no recourse to appeal. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a set of keys. He laid them on top of the papers he had brought, which were now on the floor, unwanted, like him. What are those? asked Tara with suspicion. The keys to her house, Gabe informed her. Sell it or keep it, it's hers to do with what she wants. As he left, Gabe wondered if love felt as though he was leaving a piece of himself behind, and he would never be quite whole again. Don't worry, they do get a happily ever after. Everybody does. So keep looking for the next chapter of Convincing Him, Book 9 of the Ramsley Brothers series. Happy listening!